Good morning folks and welcome to Kerbal Space Control as we prepare, make our last minute preparations to launch uh, Comsat 1 into geosynchronous orbit of Kerbin. As you can see the flight engineer is making some last minute quite fundamental changes to our flight program this morning. That's perfectly normal folks. Uh, you can expect there to be massive changes made uh, on the day of launch uh, in any kind of space program. That's just the way we roll here at uh, Kerbal Space Control. And we have liftoff of Comsat 1 as he makes his way, we hope, uh, fingers crossed, a little bit of luck, touch wood, uh, into geosynchronous orbit. So we've got pretty big payload here. Uh, I couldn't tell you what, what, what the payload is. That's not the kind of detail that we, we look at particularly. Uh, all I can tell you is that it's looking pretty darned massive. Uh, we've got uh, sort of a two-stage rocket. I don't know if you count boosters as a stage or not. Who knows? And anyway, we've got the boosters. Then we have the main stage. Then we have a second stage which contains the actual payload. It's just basically a, an engine strapped to a bunch of satellites. So, just about ready now to separate from the boosters. And we should be seeing a pretty nice sunrise there. Just see the sun Kerbal poking up over the horizon and separation. That's a nice, good, clean separation. Not always the case. Uh, geosynchronous um, orbit, geosynchronous satellites. So this is in order for us to be able to to have a, a comms network. That looks nice, doesn't it? Um, enable, enable for us to have a comms network. Um, so basically, um, we're going to put three satellites into space. They're going to remain in geosynchronous orbit, which means that the if you if to the observer on Kerbal, you'd be looking up, or sorry, Kerbin, you'd be looking up, and effectively the satellite would appear to remain in the same spot in the sky throughout the course of the day. So the orbital period of the satellite must be equal to the um, rotation of the planet. In our case, because we know Kerbin rotates. Um, uh, takes six hours to rotate and um, then we know if we can get a, an orbit period of six hours then we will be geosynchronous and that's the that's the easiest way to think about it folks don't worry too much about the actual altitudes the altitude for a um, geosynchronous orbit is around about 2869 kilometers but don't worry if you can't get the apoapsis and the periapsis to match as long as you get the orbital period correct then that is the key and we are using MegGem uh, we're actually we're using gravity turn to get us up into space. A nice, um, a nice economic uh, launch pattern. But we will be using MechJeb to make sure that we are in the correct position. It's it's all going to be controlled manually, but we're using the MechJeb uh, figures, the, the calculations to show us what to do. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You'll see in a moment. Uh, just about ready to uh, release the fairings here. Always like to release the fairings whilst we are still have a negative periapsis, so these things burn up in the in the atmosphere. If they don't burn up, they might just smash down on, on someone's head. Either way, it's fine for us, so we don't have to worry about having debris in space. Just taking a look around the spacecraft now. Everything looks pretty good. So all systems are still uh, nominal. Uh, I think that means they're good. We've got some some blinking red lights, but no one quite knows what they do. So what they mean and it doesn't seem to have stopped us before so we're just going to crack on and ignore them in fact uh, we might even put some post-it notes over them so we no longer see the red flashing warning lights okay just speaking to the flight engineer he reckons he's just about ready to to launch off these fairings he's just looking up in his manual at the moment uh, the exact button to press to to release the fairings and then we'll take a, a first look at our our payload, which is basically a um, five uh, satellite dishes, five comms dishes, strapped to a metal strut with an engine and a fuel tank attached there too. Sixty-eight thousand meters now. Continuing to uh, increase velocity. You can see we've throttled down to about a uh, third power. 
it's important this has been our first our first satellite uh, it's important that we remain within comms distance of Kerbin because we only have um, we only have comms with control center we don't have comms elsewhere on Kerbin and there you go the fairings only 10 minutes after I uh, preempted them uh, so we only have uh, we only have comms with um, Kerbin's base control. So it's important that we remain within line of sight, so that we can continue to control this spacecraft. Otherwise, this is going to be an expensive uh, splash into the ocean somewhere. And we've throttled down as we make our way up towards uh, Apoapsis where we will continue to burn outwards to our uh, Apoapsis of 2869 kilometers. Uh, actually the reason why we stopped uh, thrusting there of course is because we ran out of fuel on the main stage. So separation will be coming up shortly flight engineer just trying to work out why the engine stopped hasn't quite uh, realized yet it's because we have no more fuel in that stage at least we've got some sort of uh, orbit unfortunately uh, we unfortunately our we're going to separate this main stage with a with a periapsis of above 70,000 meters which is a shame because we like normally like our um, we normally like the uh, the main stage to, to crash down and burn up so we don't end up with debris because we are very conscious about the amount of debris we're putting up into space. Just watching the flange uh, scratch his head a little bit here at the moment. Now we've lost comms but I'm hoping we're going to pick comms back up again as we slow down and Kerbin rotates. We've actually gone for a complete orbit here. That's perfectly normal, folks. Uh, this is all planned. This is exactly what we were expecting to, to occur. So you can see Space Command there. Uh, uh, Kerbin Command, there we go. We have comms. We have comms, folks. We've got control of our expensive spaceship back again. So, out come the solar panels looking resplendent. We've got these type of, uh, uh, three different types of aerial here, or three different types of satellite dish, or three different types of radio, whatever it is you want to call it, comm system. So we're going to put this one into mission control, so now we always have a line of communication with mission control. And this one we're just going to extend because it looks nice. I'm thinking that that, uh, that huge satellite we've got in the front, that will be the satellite we use to contact the active vessel once eventually we're out on the outer reaches of our solar system exploring some of these exotic planets that we've never quite ever made it out to. So we're going to continue out now um, to a to make to an ap apoapsis of around about uh, 2869 meters we've achieved some sort of contract there inadvertently wasn't even aware that we were going to do that I'm sure that someone in the administrative uh, side of the space uh, the space center would have known that that was the case flight engineer is just uh, checking various figures here and he's burning again I'm just going to use up the last of the fuel there just to see if we can uh, just push that apoapsis out a wee bit more and I think we were aware that we might have just burned too much it's difficult to see I'm narrating this without being able to really see the numbers properly okay as I can see now we're approaching 2000, 2700 odd Yes, yeah, 2,800, and we are up to, slowing it down, just teasing the last of the fuel out. We 
and that would do us, it would appear. Right, good job. We can see the mum there, or the moon, whatever you, whatever you, way you, you wish to pronounce it. I don't want to get to, to fall foul of the uh, the Kerbal Space Program pronunciation police. I'm going to call it the moon. And Kerbin looks uh, beautiful behind us there. And we have separation of the main stage. That's successful separation. And there she is, Cobsat 1, in all her glory. Just to give it a little test burn there. And it appear we're going to, to do a warp out there to the close to our apoapsis. Now the key here is to make sure we maintain comms line of sight throughout the uh, war. You see various spaceships there also uh, orbiting Kerbin. These all contain crew members who um, need to be rescued at some point. They'll be fine. The important thing is that we crack on with our geostationary uh, satellite. I believe that life support has run out on all them vessels but that's fine. They'll just have to make do. Okay, so we're out of Apoapsis. Flight engineer just uh, points us prograde. Let's take a look at MechJeb now to see what our orbital period is. And this is the key to doing this. It's checking the orbital period. So... Orbital period 2 hours and 54 minutes currently. As soon as that hits 6 hours exactly, we know that we're in the right spot. I know the flight engineer is only thrusting at half power at the moment. As we, uh, as we accelerate, of course, our rate of acceleration should be increasing. There's some physics uh, phenomena that, that describes that. If you want to know all about that, then I suggest you watch Scott Manley and not me. But definitely some science and, and physics involved in this whole operation. We, we made sure we included science and physics when deciding how we were going to launch our satellites into space. So you can see time uh, orbital period now is 5 hours 40 minutes. I think the flight engineer should uh, very shortly just uh, make an adjustment to the to the power of the main engine there. And he just teases it up towards uh, 6 hours exactly give or take. So we're going to do a turn down the thrust limit, give us a finer control over the spacecraft. Five hours, 59 minutes, and stop it there with four seconds over. Well, that's not the thing that interests us. We are, uh, we pride ourselves on being exact, so we're now point retrograde and give it a little thrust six hours oh look at that six hours zero zero minutes zero zero point seven nine seconds it would appear the flight engineer is not happy with that he's going to go down even lower wow look at this okay zero zero point zero two seconds which means over the course of one day, we will um, appear to move westward by a tiny, 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 tiny amount. But that's fine. That's cool for us. Okay. So that's Comsat 1 up. Oh, we just flicked there onto Comsat 2 briefly. Wasn't expecting that in uh, post-edit commentary, I'll be honest. So we're going to wait here 
um, and launch. Uh, we were where well, we were. The flight engineer was thinking we should we should wait and launch uh, so that we end up with Comsat two in the right position. But of course, Comsat one is on geostationary orbit, so regardless, it's always going to be in that position relative to us. So we decided to wait until morning and do a launch of uh, of the craft in the early morning light. So we put the destination height back into the gravity turn. 2869. Press the red gravity turn lock button, sir. Uh, that's it. Woo -hoo! Thought he was going to forget. And off we go. Okay, so this is the second launch. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to skip ahead. And we're going to see what happens once we've got all three spacecraft. And all three satellites up into orbit. Okay, so we said we we're going to wait until we held three satellites up into orbit. In fact, um, just skipped ahead here. This is still the satellite Comsat 2 going up, but you can see we're already pinging our signal to Space Command, Space Control, Space Center. Um, we we change those names uh, regularly. Uh, so you can see we're pinging off for Comsat 1. So we're already using the first satellite to receive our signal to the second satellite and just as luck would have it this looks like quite a good distance away from comsat 1 so if we can get this uh this satellite here geosynchronous at this point and you can see there the signal now that we have a line of sight with uh, space center again our signal is now going directly to our communication center here at kerbin control so this looks pretty good. Okay, we're going to skip ahead again now until definitely we have all three satellites up in orbit. Okay, folks, so this is us just making those final adjustments now to ComSat 3. As you can see, the orbital period has gone four minutes over the six hours. This was due to a small error with our flight engineer. Uh, he actually was eating a, a donut and a a small piece of it dropped off and landed on the key that he was using to control our thrust. So we're going to point ourselves retrograde here and just make some slight adjustments to bring that back down again to six hours exactly. Just need to make some changes to the thrust limit now. Okay, final adjustments made, 20 seconds. Ten seconds, talk among yourselves. Three, two, one. There we go. Point four, point two, point something or other. Can't read it on the screen, but it's pretty darn close to six hours exactly. So there you can see, you can kind of see the triangular formation there made by our three satellites. And quick saving as always. Okay, let's go to the tracking station now, uh, where we should be able to get a better view of what uh, of what we're looking at. Right, so you can see the the three satellites. We need to to rename these. Um, oh, there we go. GeoSat one, GeoSat two, and GeoSat three. There they are. Three of them, resplendent, perfect triangle. As long as you can see, as long as all three of them can see each other, they're not blocked by the planet, then it's fine. It'll work perfectly well as a geostationary uh, comms system. So basically, two of them will always be in view from any spaceship anywhere uh, around the uh, around the, so the solar system or the Kerbal system. What you need to do now is you need to make sure that you link one satellite to the other. So on one satellite you select a, 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 a respectively sized antenna. You make sure that, that is linked to, so Geo on, G, on GeoSat 1 you'll make sure that is linked to GeoSat 2 and you'll make sure there's one pointing at GeoSat 3. On GeoSat 2 you make sure there's one that's linked to GeoSat 1 and GeoSat 3. 
and on GeoSat 3 you make sure there's one that's linked to GeoSat 2 and GeoSat 1. So basically there's a two-way link between every satellite. Then on the satellite that's in line of sight with the Space Center, you need to make sure that one satellite, that one um, comms dish is pointing to the uh, to the space to, to mission control. And once you've done that, you should end up with a, a perfect geostationary uh, satellite system. And that, fellow Kerbonauts, is how you put up a geosynchronous or geostationary or keostationary, as a lot of people refer to it in Kerbin, because it's uh, you should put a K wherever you can, that's the rules. Um, that's how you put up a, a keo or geostationary satellite system. Um, so, other things we need to do, now that this is up, we do have, uh, obviously, our moon base to build. Plus, we have a, um, I think in the next video, we're going to do some docking in space so if you're interested in how we do that and why we do that then uh, feel free we're going to obviously expand out we've, we've got some uh, so far we've got some exploration on Mimus. we've got some exploration on the moon we've landed a Kerbin on the moon uh don't think we haven't landed on Mimus yet but uh we're just in the those early stages those exciting stages of uh expanding our knowledge of our solar system so join us again next time um subscribe and like etc etc you know what to do and we'll see you on the other side. Cheerio.